Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's really a, a true pleasure today to have with us one of the giants of uh, acute myeloid leukemia and myeloid neoplasms in general. So Dr. Uh, Marina Konopliva is a professor in the Department of Oncology and Molecular Pharmacology and the Merriam Faculty Scholar in uh, Cancer Research at the Albert Einstein College of uh, medicine after spending many, many years in the MD Anderson, where she has really made fantastic contributions, including very important drugs that have been approved, uh, both in acute myeloid uh, leukemia and uh, plastic dendritic myelo uh, myeloid neoplasm. So she received her doctor of medicine from the first Pavlov um, Medicine Institute in St. Petersburg in uh, Russia, and then got a PhD in experimental hematology from the Federal Institute of Hematology and Blood Transfusion. So Dr. Konopliva's research has focused on patients with hematologic malignancies, both including acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, as well as high-risk MDS. And uh, her research, as I mentioned, have led to important, not only uh, science and advancement, but also therapeutic translation, especially venetoclax, which really has changed the landscape of how we treat patients with uh, AML, CLL, potentially MDS and other um, conditions. And uh, on a personal level, I think Dr. Konopleva is very known in the field to be a fantastic mentor. She has mentored some of the most uh, productive uh, researchers in the field, as well as uh, being a very nice and very uh, good person to interact with. So I encourage as many of you to talk to her if you can today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Amarit, for this very kind introduction. I'm happy to be here. This is my first time at Yale, and I'm looking forward for the day and meeting a lot of you. And so today I wanted to take you through uh, our story on BSO2. I know this is like a general grand round for both heme and solid malignancies, but I think targeting cell death is probably important for uh, including for the solid tumors as well. And I'll show you some of the kind of ways we think about that as well. Uh, so these are my disclosures. Uh, uh, and as you all know, the resistance to cell death is one of the hallmarks of uh, cancer. And it's largely governed by the BSO2 uh, family proteins, which are listed here. Um, it's quite complicated. I'll show you later how the system works. Uh, but the, essentially, there's uh, overexpression of different BSO2 family members, depending on the tumor type. Uh, for example, in myeloid malignancies, and uh, we have mainly BSO2. In TALL, we also have BCLXL and BCO2, and MCO1 is kind of ubiquitous. And I think in solid tumors, BCLXL is a primary anti-apoptotic uh, molecule. The way the system works is by dimerization of anti-apoptotic with the pro-apoptotic family members, uh, and uh, there are quite a few of those as well. Uh, so BAGs, I will talk to you uh, several times in my talk. So this is what we call executioner cell death protein. So essentially kills the cells by making pores in the mitochondrial membrane and inducing cytochrome C release. And then there are a lot of this BHA-only proteins, which essentially bind BSO2 or others and inhibit their function. Because it works through dimerization, you can actually um, inhibit the function of BSO2 by inhibiting the protein-protein interactions uh, between, for example, BSO2 and some of these prodest proteins. And as a result, you'll have a release of this uh, propoptotic members and killing of the cell death. Uh, so this was uh, pioneered in the first uh, um, attempt. Um, this was a paper back in 2005 at the time, the company was called Abbott, and they designed the first protein-protein inhibitor, um, which was called ABT737. So this was a work from Stephen Fezzik, Saul Rosenberg, and others uh, uh, that effectively inhibited the uh, BSO2. So the structure here is actually the structure of BCLXL. So they used the NMR-based technology to engineer this molecule. And green protein here is one of these uh, uh, proteins called BAC. Um, it's not even here, but it's uh, one of the BHA-only proteins. Uh, there are some critical, critical radius, radius how it binds to B-cell like cell. And this is the actual molecule, which you can see it sits into that pocket, and this mimics the B B back interaction with B-cell like cell in this matter. Uh, this is another structure. Uh, this is pretty large molecule, about 960 kD, uh, but this was the first uh, 
And I think the most successful protein-protein inhibitor interaction, I think the only other class that I'm aware of are MDM2P53 inhibitors, um, but they're still not approved due to toxicities. Now, uh, this molecule was a two molecule and its analog called Navidoclax did go into clinical trials, but because it blocked both BCLX cell and BCL2, it encountered some toxicities in the form of a thrombocytopenia because BCLX cell is important for platelet production. But I'll get back to you in the end. I think BCLX cell targeting is very important and there are other ways of uh, safely inhibit BCLX cell. So navidoclax is still not approved. Uh, and so uh, moving forward, uh, in 2013, the same company, now it's called Abvi, engineered the original molecule and they got rid of BCLX cell interaction. So apparently this aspartate uh, 103 is uh, a critical residual, which is different between BCL2 and BCLX cell. And so they engineered the new molecule that had now very specific BCL2 only properties. So it only bound BCL2. It was about 10 times more potent than original navidoclax, and it did not inhibit BCLX cell. And this is what we now uh, know as uh, venetoclax, uh, the drug that is approved for several types of hematologic malignancies. So, and of course, it spared platelets because it did not inhibit BCLX cell. So uh, I started working on BCL2 when I came to US. That was my first project. At the time, we initially used the antisense, but antisense didn't make it in clinic. They were not effective enough, not specific enough. And then uh, when the original camp compound came out, uh, we developed the story on AML and BCL2 with ABT737, which we published in uh, 2006. And then when the new compound uh, came out, because navidoclax never made it to AML trials. Again, AML patients, as you know, have all low platelets to start with. So it was kind of impossible at that time to transition into AML trials. Uh, when the new compound came out, we teamed up with the Tony Litai's lab at Dana Farber, and we worked for a year between two of our labs and uh, published a cancer discovery paper in 2014 showing that uh, venetoclax is highly effective in acute myeloid leukemia preclinical studies. So, um, so these are just, I'm not gonna go through the paper or data that's all published, but these are just mRNA level for BCO2 amongst different types of leukemia. And the red line represents so the normal uh, uninvolved bone marrow. This was from a, a Hyperlux MLL collection. So you can see that majority of AML, this is a log scale, have upregulated mRNA for BCL2. There are some examples here, some, some, some that don't. For example, this inversion 3 AML do, do not, but the uh, majority have high levels of BCL2. We also show that it's expressed on leukemia stem cells, and then we show that if you target BCL2, you eliminate AML uh, blasts and AML stem cells to some extent, and also the compound had uh, efficacy in vivo, although by itself, it, it was not curative, and it wasn't curative in patients either. So uh, this work, uh, uh, in conjunction with the CLL data that Amar mentioned, so at that time, uh, venetoclax was already in CLL trials and was very, very effective. It caused tumor lysis, and uh, actually they had some deaths because of tumor lysis. So it's B CLL is super dependent on BCO2, so it's like the primary BCO2 dependent disease. Uh, but we already knew the dose. Uh, uh, we knew the safety profile of this molecule was fairly safe uh, um, besides this tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, so it was sort of sufficient based on this work to take venetoclax into AML uh, relapse refractory study. So this study was uh, uh, conducted between different institutions uh, and was published uh, in Cancer Discovery back in 2016. So initially we projected that we're gonna treat 50 ML patients uh, and we were hoping for response rate around 40 to 50% based on our preclinical work. And I have to say that this did not pan out. So we learned that AML is way too complicated and probably our preclinical models do not really faithfully recapitulate the response in, in patients. So the response rate, objective response rate in the trial was only 19% with the CRCRI rates. Uh, but about 50% of patients did have blast reductions uh, as shown here on this waterfall uh, plot. Um, and then there were some subsets of patients who tend to be more sensitive to that. For example, patients who had IDH1 two mutations, uh, uh, they generally had response and the response among those was about 32%. So that was encouraging. And in fact, we enriched the study uh, for the IDH1-2 mutated patients because at the same time, the paper came out from Stanford 
showing that this subset of AML is highly BCO2 dependent. And that turns to be true till now. These patients respond very well to Navitoclot, to Navitoclot, sorry. Uh, but essentially, uh, that was encouraging, but it was clearly not enough for, to get this drug approved as a single agent in the salvage setting. Um, and of course, for me as a researcher, that was a uh, disappointment because I thought this was like the best drug I ever had in the lab, and still it's not, you know, curing people. Uh, the duration of responses was also pretty short, about three to six months, and uh, uh, all patients progressed after that. So fortunately, the story did not stop at this point, as you know. Uh, and so why we think that AML, uh, in AML targeting BCO2 alone is not sufficient? Well, first of all, because there's a redundancy in expression of BCO2 family protein. So if you just look at this Western blood, this is from uh, uh, Andrew Way's publication. Again, BCO2 is al almost ubiquitously expressed at high levels. Uh, BCLXL is usually not expressed or low expressed, but uh, I'll tell you which subsets do have BCLXL. And then there's uh, MCL1, uh, which is a uh, myelot-specific sort of uh, uh, BCO2 family member. It's uh, ubiquitously expressed as well. So uh, uh, you can imagine that if you target only BCO2, you leave some other members untouched, and therefore cells probably quickly adapt to the, uh, this effect, and they rewire, and they become resistant. So how can you get around that? Uh, so the nice thing is that um, any type of chemotherapy can actually, in the setting of wild type P53, can induce expression of this pro-apoptotic family members that I mentioned before, what we call BHA-only proteins. And this BHA-only proteins can, in fact, uh, inhibit MCL1. So as you can envision, you can have synergy between venetoclax and pretty much any type of chemotherapy that would induce this response. Um, and then you inhibit BCO2, so you sensitize the cells, and then there's back-to-back -back, uh, interaction and uh, cell death. So practically speaking, uh, this went into development in all the AML patients unfit for chemotherapy, because for younger patients, we had 7 plus 3, which we still have, and they were doing pretty well with the transplant. But for older patients, uh, there was really like no standard of care. Uh, low-dose itabine or hypermethylene agents have been used. Um, so I have to say that uh, based on the clinical need more than the science, uh, the combination trials were with hypermethylene agents and low-dose itabine and all done fit uh, for chemotherapy EML patients. And uh, these were the results of the initial phase 1B study um, uh, when uh, venetoclax was combined either with azacitidine or with a decitabine uh, hypermethylating agents, or even with low-dose cytarabine, which by itself has very little activity in AML. And you can see here that, uh, well, you know, this was a newly diagnosed patient, so uh, with very rapidly was transitioned to the newly diagnosed AML which I think was another difference with the original trial that we used, uh, where we used phenetoclax, where it was relapse refractory setting. But you can see that, you know, majority of patients, in fact, responded. And uh, they did achieve, like, true uh, CRs. Uh, there was some dose escalation findings as well, but eventually 400 milligram ended up uh, the right dose for the HMA and 600 for the low-dose cytabine combination. So the responses, the responses uh, tend to be durable. And there was very little toxicity. So suddenly the older patients, which for which we didn't really have cures before, in one month they were going into remission. Um, the infections and malsuppression was still the main toxicity. But other than that, uh, we didn't see like much effect on the kidney, liver, or anything, which was, to me, always the most surprising thing because BCO2 is so ubiquitously expressed. So who could imagine that targeting BCO2 is so safe? I think before we go into clinic, we can never really predict what happens. And then eventually this uh, resulted in the randomized uh, phase three study called Viali A study, uh, where um, uh, Venaza, what we call venetoclax azacide, was uh, randomized to azacide in placebo control. It was two to one randomization. And this was for all the patients with AML ineligible for chemotherapy. Uh, the median age was close to 70 years old. And um, uh, you can see that the as far as response rate, majority of the patients achieved response, was, which was in the range of 60 to 70%. Uh, there was lower in p 3 mutated AML, which we learned later is a, a, a problem for this approach. Uh, but overall, there was high response rate. Uh, but most importantly, there was survival advantage uh, compared with ASA. Uh, with the uh, median overall survival of about 14 months and uh, compared to nine months with azacitidine. 
So this led in uh, 2018 uh, to the accelerated approval of venetoclax and AML and subsequently to the full approval in combination with the chemotherapy. Uh, Low-dose aterabine is also approved, but uh, even though they missed the primary endpoint, but the uh, overall survival was still better. But I think it's very rarely used in the uh, United States um, uh, and the survival is shorter, only about nine months. So this is like what Amar said is considered to be breakthrough. Um, but you know, if you look at the curves, uh, you can say that, uh, is this really like a breakthrough? Because majority of the patients are still you know, dying from their disease. Uh, initially it seemed to be like plateau here at 30%. So now the curve dropped down to about 20 to 25% with about four years of follow-up. So it still stands, but um, uh, clearly, you know, uh, it was not a curative approach. Uh, and that kind of prompted our lab and many other groups going back to the kind of drawing board and trying to understand uh, how we can improve on that and what are mechanisms of resistance and how we can, can combine with other agents. Uh, so in the rest of my talk, I will show you like several like examples from our lab, uh, how we kind of developed the new agents for the combination. Some of them are in trial, some of them are uh, hopefully getting to approval soon. And this is sort of a summary of how we can think uh, of potential combinations and resistance mechanisms. Uh, uh, this figure was done by one of our fellows. Uh, um, and again, going back to like how the drugs work, right? So again, you have BSU2, you have uh, it pre-complex with BHA only protein, which allows you to block this interaction. And this is a drug, uh, venetoclax, it's called BHA mimetic because it mimics BHA only proteins. So it binds here, it displaces this BHA only, and then uh, these proteins have to activate backs and back. So again, backs and back are very critical because without that, uh, there's no cell death. And they have to go into the mitochondrial membrane and the induced cytochrome C release. Uh, so one thing that I already mentioned that there's a redundancy. So if you have upregulation of this other uh, BSU2 family members, uh, you can get resistance, right? Because they can, even though you do have displacement, what happens is that this BHA only protein Instead of going to the backs, it will go and bind this other protein uh, members. So how can you get this upregulation? Um, of course, it may have been before pre-existent. For example, in monocytic AML, there's upregulation of MCL1 because of the lineage uh, dependency on MCL1. But then there are a lot of mutations, and uh, these mutations we call them signaling mutations, uh, uh, which we know can upregulate both MCL1, BCLXL, and BCL12A1. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of those. So this will lead to resistance. And of course, you might want to think of targeting those mutations. So the other major mechanism of resistance is the P53 loss. And I already mentioned that P53 is critical for BHA-only proteins induction. Uh, but on top of that, P53 transcriptionally uh, controls BACs. So BACs levels are lower in, P in P53 lost AML. Um, and there's also other mechanisms of resistance. So um, this remains unmet need in the field of AML and MDS. And then there are uh, some other mechanisms. For example, Yanis Afendis uh, group has published uh, uh, the mitochondria uh, resistance to the venetoclax through upregulation of some of the Scrista proteins such as CLIP B um, and also mitophagy uh, kind of selection of the um, healthy mitochondria and there's some effort uh, uh, as far as drug discovery in that field as well. But going back to the patients, uh, so what did we see like from this uh, mechanisms, uh, what did we see as far as uh, resistance development? Um, and be before that, I have to say that uh, we also developed in the lab a venetoclax resistant cell line. So we decided to take sort of unbiased approach and uh, we generated uh, four uh, van resistant cell lines. They're available for anyone who wants to use them. Uh, by prolonged exposure to the drug in the tissue culture lab. And it took only about three months to generate the cells, so about the same time as our patients to progress. And then we did all kind of uh, met uh, metabolomic, genomic, uh, proteomic profiling, and um, epigenetic profiling as well. So one pathway that came out kind of screaming at us, which was not a new pathway, but it was something that we already knew from before, it was MAP kinase pathway. So it was upregulated on the RNA level, and then we confirmed that in the by immunoblotting analysis, you can see upregulation of some of the MAP kinase pathway uh, proteins uh, 
And as a result, uh, MAP kinase uh, can uh, stabilize MCL1 protein. So it's not transcriptional, but on the level of the protein. And we did see that in all the three cell lines, MCL1 levels were upregulated, as you would expect. And then if you use either MCL1 inhibitors or knockout of MCL1, you get tremendous synergy with venetoclax and the cells are, are dying off. Um, so I'm not going to talk about MCL1 inhibitors, but suffice to say that they are not approved uh, because of toxicity. So again, like thinking why BCL2 is so safe and MCL1 is not safe. So MCL1 tends to be very important for the uh, heart muscles. And uh, so patients treated on the clinical trials with MCL1 inhibitors, they have what we call troponin leak and uh, potentially, you know, cardiac toxicity. So that hampered the whole like development of MCL1 inhibitors and uh, it's not clear whether they actually have therapeutic windows. Um, so, but uh, in the lab, uh, these are the great sensitizers to venetoclax. So then we went back to patients and we know that in patients, uh, RAS mutations are fairly common in AML. On their own, they don't have prognostic significance, uh, but they can arise uh, at the time of progression. And so when we looked at the patients treated on the HMA venetoclax trials, at the time of relapse, uh, they had like expansion of this uh, RAS, KRAS, NRAS clones, uh, uh, also PTPN11 clones, which is not shown here, uh, fairly quickly within like six months or so. This is single cell DNA sequencing data. Uh, we also looked at the so of patients by immunoblotting. So we did show upregulation of MCL1 and the upregulation of MAP kinase pathway. And this is on the histochemistry level. At the time of progression, MCL1 was up and BCL2 was uh, downregulated. The problem, of course, that uh, in AML, we don't have RAS inhibitors. We are really hoping that we can get them from the solid tumors, uh, but the companies have been so focused on the lung cancer and they have been reluctant to go into AML. So we are still trying to convince them that pan RAS inhibitor would be a great uh, uh, thing to have in uh, AML, and we actually have data with the, in the lab that the combination is really striking. Uh, the paper is submitted, but uh, right now we don't have anything. So we also did the engineer this in the lab. So we put the uh, NRAS G12D into AML cell line, which was DOCS inducible. Uh, we showed that the cells become resistant to venetoclax, but again, the MCL1 inhibitors work alone or in combination. Uh, we did the mouse study with MCL1 inhibitors and there was a reduction of the tumor growth, but we don't have MCL1 inhibitors and we don't have RAS inhibitors. So we are like uh, at a loss right now, but we're working on that. <laughs> so this uh, MAP kinase upregulation, I think is one of the major uh, kind of resistance. Uh, when you use HMA VAN, it's not an issue when you use chemotherapy VAN because RAS clone is very sensitive to the re regular chemotherapy, which is uh, kind of a relief. Um, and this data we sort of confirmed that this was a large analysis. I think the paper is under review uh, from Viali A study, uh, looking at different genomic subsets of patients uh, who are, and uh, time to progression, or this is rather survival. This was presented at, uh, by Hartman Donner at the last ASH. And so they basically show that the classical uh, kind of ELN classifications do not predict very well the response or duration of response. Uh, but when they did looked at different genomic subsets, um, again, P50 mutated AML did very poorly. So survival was only about five months here, same as you get with HMA. Uh, but this intermediate cohort, uh, it actually included patients with RAS mutation. So RAS mutation was confirmed to be like resistance factor for the HMA band. And also another mutation, signaling mutation, uh, flix 3 flix itd mutation. Uh, so this data are being sort of refined. Uh, um, I told you a little about the RAS story. Now, FLIX3 is another very common mutation. About 30% of patients have uh, FLIX3 mutations. Unfortunately, we have drugs for those that are being approved. Uh, so of course, like we jumped into that very early on. And in fact, we saw that in, even in the original phase one study where we sh showed upregulation of this or selection of the clones with the flix itd or RAS mutations in people who relapse or were primary refractory. And very similar, this like selection of the flix itd clone with the therapy using the single cell tapestry sequencing. Um, and the sort of uh, why flix itd The story is very similar to RAS. So, uh, here you have, you know, the same RAS map kinase pathway. You also have a population of some other ones that five uh, PS3 kinase AKT, but eventually it all comes down to this MCL1. So MCL1 phosphorylation 
is regulated by both MEP kinase and also there's a STAT pathway uh, dependent on phosphorylation. So when MC1 is phosphorylated, it's uh, stable. So the levels are increased and the protein cannot be degraded, otherwise it's short-lived protein. So essentially there's also some B-cell XL component, but I think it's minor. But the nice thing is all downstream of flix 3 ITD. So we say, okay, if we inhibit flix 3 what happens with MC1? Uh, so we used quizartinib for that matter, and we showed nice inhibition of the flix 3 MC1 did go down, but it wasn't that huge up down regulation. But we also showed that the protein called BIM was induced. And BIM can um, is a pro-apoptotic BHA only protein that can inhibit MC1. So the combination of these two uh, makes cells sensitive to uh, venetoclax. Um, and this is a BHA profiling assay, which I don't have time to explain in detail, but essentially you throw the peptides on the cells and see which dependency they have. But the point here is that if you treat cells with flix 3 inhibitors, you have huge upregulation of BCO2 dependency uh, to the peptide or to the actual uh, uh, venetoglux drugs. So you have synergy in vitro, and in this model, we, that was like a subcutaneous model, not a great model for AML, but we subsequently published also PDX models. We show like essential uh, um, cures of the mice for that matter when we use the quizatinib and venetoglux combination. So this did go into clinical development, and uh, uh, for the trials, uh, another flix inhibitor, second generation giltritin, was uh, selected. And this paper is now published in uh, JCO by um, MD Anderson Group and many other collaborators, where there was combination of venetoclax and giltritin for relapse refractory flix mutated AML. Um, and there was quite significant uh, response rate in all patients or in those who failed prior flix 3 TKIs alone. And if they went for the transplant, they actually the survival looks uh, fairly good. Um, the data by Cassie Smith showed that the flix 3 clones were extinguished after this combination. I have to say that she did show that RAS clones were coming up in patients who progressed. So RAS is still a resistance mechanism even in that setting. Uh, but uh, um, again, this was a quite impressive sort of uh, uh, advance in the field of flix mutated AML. Now, of course, we all know that treating patients is best at the time of diagnosis. So for all the patients, uh, we cannot use chemotherapy. So MD uh, group has pioneered what we call triplet. So triplet is essentially azavan, which is a backbone. And then you add the third drug. In this case, is uh, giltritinib. Um, and this paper is also now accepted in uh, JCO. Now, this is single center trial. There's a lot of discussion on Twitter whether it's like you know uh, true or not. But uh, at least you know data from MD Anderson look very impressive. Um, now, when you see 100% response rate, you always kind of pause. But that's what they reported and 30 newly diagnosed patients with AML. Um, and the estimated survival at uh, two years was 70%. So this is like way better than what we had before, uh, but they had to like reduce a lot of duration of the drugs and uh, work out the schedule because the combination is mild suppressive. So the major like heme toxicity of venetoclax is mild suppression. So neutropenia is uh, because uh, myeloid cells express BSO2. And so when you use the venetoclax in combinations, you have to cut back. And that's a, a continuing discussions with FDA because the approved scale is 28 days of venetoclax. Uh, so there's a randomized study right now ongoing, which hopefully will kind of uh, solidify this question um, run by Astellas and Abby, uh, where the same combination is being used uh, in the frontline, all the AML settings. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but uh, again, uh, what do we do about RAS? So uh, this is like very early preclinical work. We're working with Everest Gavasiotis at uh, Einstein, and he developed the RAF inhibitor. So kind of downstream of uh, uh, RAS um, that inhibit is allosteric RAF inhibitor that uh, he is about to publish in solid tumors. Uh, uh, but we show that in cell lines with uh, K or NRAS mutation is highly effective drug. You see inhibition of the pathway and there's some uh, additive effect with the netoclux. So we kind of continue working on that. So hopefully we'll get either RAS inhibitors or RAF inhibitors. Uh, we did test the MEK inhibitors. Uh, I didn't show you that. We published that. We went all the way into clinic, but MEK inhibitors uh, caused a lot of GI talks. And so the trial was unsuccessful. So it was stopped uh, uh, for lack of efficacy and high toxicity. Uh, so we can't really use the MAC inhibitors, unfortunately, in this combination. So uh, work to be
continued on this topic. Um, so there are a lot of other combinations with vanilla clocks that have been sort of published. This is just uh, uh, some nice summary that was presented at last EHA. Um, and uh, the combination with IDH inhibitors that are now in clinical trials, uh, um, in both in AML and MDS, I have to say. Uh, there's many inhibitor combination, which looks super exciting. Of course, MCL1 went to, tr to trials, but it's uh, struggling. Um, there was Magrolimab combination, which we pioneered, but right now Magrolimab is, uh, all the trials have stopped. So I'm not going to talk to you about that today. And, but I want to show some data with the immune approaches. Uh, in this case is antibody drug conjugate. Uh, so kind of a little bit different story with venetoclax. Uh, so we used, uh, we looked at CD123 because CD123 is a subunit of R3 receptor alpha and is ubiquitously expressed in AML, also this other love of my BPDCN, uh, and uh, in some ALL as well. It's expressed in stem cells <laughs> based on Craig Jordan's work, uh, and is sort of uh, the only antigen right now that we're kind of trying to target as far as immune therapy in AML and MDS. We, there are other efforts, but none of them have been successful yet. Uh, so we've been working with this company, Immunogen, uh, that developed the uh, um, antibody drug Conjugate, uh, so they have the antibody against CD123 uh, that through the linker is uh, bound to the um, alkylator that <clears throat> produces the single-strand DNA damage. So obviously it's internalized and, uh, um, and you know kills the cells through the DNA damage. Kind of chemotherapy, but in a targeted fashion. Um, so it had the good single-agent activity in BPDCN and AML. Uh, the company has filed approval for BPDCN uh, patients as second line. So hopefully we get this drug approved pretty, pretty soon. And so we, of course, ask the question, can we combine the two? Because this is like, you know, the immune therapy that seems to be working. So we've done quite a bit of preclinical work. It's not published yet, but we show that the compound is fairly um, specific. So these are AML cells. This in red is CD123 expression. So again, majority of cells do express it and they're being killed by this uh, drug. Uh, but then the cells that don't express, uh, uh, there's no killing and KG1 is resistant. We're not quite sure uh, why, but it seems to be specific. And then we ran the combinations, uh, both with the nadoclux and azacitidine and the triplet, because now we're in the triplet era, right? And you can see here, so these are different cell lines. I have to say that ITD cells have high expression of C123, which is why we selected those for the combination trials. Uh, but especially with the triplet, there's quite a bit of uh, synergy. Um, what about P50 mutant AML? Uh, so these are wild type cells, so they're sensitive in the uh, mutant or loss, P53 loss, uh, uh, we see less activity. There's still some induction of cell dust, but uh, it's actually quite resistant to both of the compounds. Uh, we're not quite sure how that is affected. So for some reason, the cells had very high expression of MCL1. Uh, we're still working on to understand that because we did see induction of DNA damage in both uh, knockdown cells and the wild type cells, and there's a PARP cleavage. Uh, but it's a uh, less killing, um, and that is also reflected in the trial. The PFC mutated patients didn't do as well. Um, as you can imagine, the drug uh, abolishes the S phase. Uh, so this is like IMGN alone and the different concentrations. And then when you combine with uh, Venesa, you essentially you kill off the S phase cells, so you don't have anything left. Uh, you do get uh, activation of gamma H2AX as a DNA damage and cleaved caspase. So then we try to understand the mechanism, how that works. Uh, um, and uh, um, so one thing is uh, we know that, again, IMGN inducing the single cell DNA strand breaks. So we showed the uh, phosphor P53 uh, pregulation, which was the same with or without venetoclax. Uh, uh, but then we saw that the drug inducing the, the, the DNA repair pathway phosphor check one. And uh, it seemed to be less with venetoclax. So we are, it's kind of off story, but we are trying to understand if BCO2 inhibition can actually be involved in the control of DNA damage, which is uh, hard to understand because it's um, a cytosolic and this is DNA, but we are kind of working through the story, still uh, trying to figure out all the parts of the DNA pathway. But it has some like clinical or preclinical implications because if you uh, use uh, IMGN first, followed by venetoclax, you have very striking synergy. This bliss index is 18. If you do the reverse, 
when first followed by IMGN, uh, there's very little synergy. Now in the clinic, it's given concomitantly. So I think it's fine, but, <laughs> and nobody's interested in understanding the kinetics, but I think that biologically, this is interesting uh, phenomenon and perhaps something to do with DNA damage repair that we are working on. Uh, we also showed that the IMGN primes towards BCO2 inhibition. Um, so I didn't, I have a lot of like mouse data, which I didn't show you, but uh, the clinical trial um, has been reported at ASH and the paper is also now accepted in JCO. So this is a triplet. Um, so again, the drug is now called Pivacumab, Pivac, we abbreviate that. It was used with Azavan in newly diagnosed AML. Uh, all the patients, uh, you know, majority were unfit, but uh, there were some fit patients as well. So it was fairly safe. So uh, again, the drug has some toxicities, uh, but generally speaking, it was well tolerated. Um, and then uh, the response rates were, I would say, similar to the Azavan, but what was impressive was um, MRD negativity rate. So the depth of response uh, was, uh, you get about 40% with Azavan, and it was about 76%, or 79 so almost doubling the depth of response. Now, we don't know yet if that translates into survival, which will be a critical question. Um, so now immunogen is bought by AbbVie, so we're hoping that this will continue into randomized phase three study, and maybe we'll have that triplet uh, in a few years fully characterized. Uh, but if you look at this, like three subsets that I showed you before, um, so again, the good kind of prognostic patient that respond well to, P to Azavan, they did really well. Um, these are response rates. Uh, in P50 mutant, um, there was about 20% full CR rate, but 50% uh, overall response rate. So maybe there is kind of, you know, some signal again, with P50 mutation, we are kind of really at loss. So um, that, you know, but again, this will be developed hopefully further and we'll see a few years from now where that uh, lands. Now, P53, so I already told you several times that this is like a major unmet need in AML and MDS. All the drugs that we had in phase three have failed for the most part. Um, and uh, even from the very initial studies, we've showed that this was a major resistance factor to venetoclax as well, unfortunately. So patients who, again, uh, relapsed or who were primary refractory, they had high uh, rates of uh, 17P loss or P53 mutation or uh, both. Um, and why that is the case, so um, first of all, if you do like single cell DNA sequencing, this is from Andrew Way's paper, you showed, uh, uh, you know, all these clones are being selected for. So it's almost like a pressure to select these clones for, uh, the, because they do not get killed by venetoclax. So, and what he showed in this paper is that uh, while in parental cells, uh, venetoclax induces Bax activation by this assay, uh, there's much less in the PPC knockout cells. Um, and uh, you can sensitize it by MC1 inhibition, but again, we don't have MC1 inhibitors in the clinic. So what do we do about that? We, we don't really know, but I want to show you some clinical data from our Einstein program that was developed before I got there using a different approach. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the approach that uh, they decided to go forward wa was really developed by Jürgen, uh, uh, I cannot pronounce his last name, but uh, at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, <clears throat> so he is, I think, the most knowledgeable person in HMA uh, field. Uh, so essentially, he published the first study in MDS, as I'm sure Amar knows very well. And he compared the traditional dosing of decibin with what he calls metronomic dosing, which is once a week, like one-fifth of the dose. So really like tiny doses of decibin. But he showed that this is enough to uh, deplete DNMT3, DNMT1. So you don't really need to induce this, you know, constant cytotoxic DNA damaging response of HMAs. Um, and then he showed in preclinical work that it can induce differentiation of P53 uh, novel clo uh, loss clones. Um, now the resistance to the decidamin is mediated by upregulation of pyrimidine synthesis. Again, this is all his work. And he had some preclinical data that venetoclax can in fact uh, um, reduce the pyramid in synthesis. Uh, um, so there may be potential synergy there. So based on this sort of preclinical rationale, uh, the team at Einstein have developed this metronomic dosing of uh, uh, decidabin and venetoclax. So now you have a newly diagnosed patient with AML or MDS who comes to clinic and gets once a week 
uh, injection of desilbin subcutaneously and one dose of venetoclax. So I would say I had a hard time believing that when I got there, but I think <laughs> now I'm sort of converted and uh, we are continuing the development of this in the prospective trial. Um, so again, this is like a schedule. This is like traditional what you do. You give venetoclax for 28 days and you give desilbin for five days or ASA for seven days and then you repeat the cycle. And here it's like once a week. Uh, so the idea is really to get away from the DNA damaging response because we know that PFC mutated cells are only being selected by any DNA damaging drugs. They don't care. Uh, and get into this hypermethylating uh, effect. How that works, we don't know, right? Uh, hypermethylating agents, uh, mechanism of actions is still not fully understood. Uh, but the idea was, can we like really use that approach and at least have some benefit? So they published this paper. This was a retrospective uh, study using this regimen. And now, as I said, we are in the prospective study. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a bit difficult slide. Uh, but the point is that uh, there was no really like uh, mouse suppression, uh, but the response rate was quite significant and CR rate was 57%, which was fairly similar to the VLA study. And then when we looked at the small numbers, again, this is all like very early on of p mutated patients, the survival was about 10 months and a lot of patients actually achieved full remission, became transfusion independent and they did very well. They relapsed like a clock at 10, 11 months. So it's not a curative approach, but at least, you know, we can extend the uh, survival. Again, in VLA is five months survival in many other studies. Now this is 10 months, again, small number, non-randomized studies. So with all the caveats, uh, uh, but we are quite excited about that, and uh, we are thinking of what can we add to that to really like capitalize on this approach, you know, um, using this metronomic dosing. Uh, so one thing is like in the lab, we are trying to use some of the BACs activated. So I told you several times that BACs is really like critical, and the BACs is not working with p is uh, lost. Uh, uh, so we have a collaboration with uh, again Everest and also Jerry Chipok who developed the direct BACS activators or BACS modulators. Uh, um, so we are thinking maybe if we use those compounds as a preclinical stage, we can overcome the PVC mut mutant loss, but this remains to be seen. Um, okay, so switching gears. So this was PVC mutated AML and now going back to the chemotherapy. So as I showed you before, there's a like, very good rationale to combine the netoclax with the chemotherapy and AML. And there are a lot of trials which have been already reported. Um, and uh, now we're getting the response rate of about 90%. So this is like, like was unheard of before, uh, but when you add venetoclax to chemotherapy, you really get a tremendous synergy. So in our center, we have this also uh, IST that is run by Dr. Manzaris, where we use the standard 7 plus 3 plus venetoclax, different durations and so forth. The trial is still ongoing, but again, the response rate are about 90% is still like short uh, follow-up. So we don't really know like survival, uh, but we are quite excited about this approach. Except p 50 mutated patients, they relapse and they don't do well. So we stopped using this for even younger p 50 mutated patients because all patients, five patients we treated with, they all relapsed and uh, uh, they died from, despite the fact that some of them achieved remission. So again, PVC remains uh, an issue. So we're looking at the stem cell extinction with the therapy and doing a lot of research with that. Um, and in the last 10 minutes of my talk, I'll go back to B-select cell, which may be of interest to more uh, broader kind of uh, auditorium. Uh, so B-select cell is a cousin of BCL2, and uh, it's less expressed in the AML, but it's expressed in solid tumors. Uh, it is expressed in the TELL subsets. So this was work from Tony Lutaif now a few years ago, a number of years ago, that showed that the typical TELL actually depends on BCLXL. And if you use this uh, Navitoclax drug that didn't make it, you actually get very good responses. Uh, there's a subset that is BCL2 dependent, but I'm not gonna go into that. Now, I already told you that the liability of BCLXL inhibitors is thrombocytopenia because uh, platelets depend on B-cell cell for survival. So you get on target toxicity, and of course it's challenging to dose. So, uh, and you know, this is just the cartoon we published this review recently. So navitoclax, right? The drug that is still not approved. It works just as venetoclax, so inhibits the complexes inducing backs back, but it causes thrombocytopenia, killing the platelets. Uh, um, 
So the way around that, at least that's ongoing work, is to use the degraders for BCL XL degraders. Uh, um, so we have been collaborating with a team from uh, Da Hong Zhou, who was before in the University of Florida, and now he moved to the uh, San Antonio. So he developed this uh, POTAC, um, BCL XL degrader, uh, where the ligand is essentially navitoclax, so same drug, um, but then there's a linker that links it to the uh, VHL E3 ligase. So you can ask why that is better than inhibitor, right? First of all, it's huge molecule, so it has uh, pharmacological properties, issues. Uh, uh, but the thing is that this E3 ligase is not expressed in platelets. So you're not getting degradation of B-cell, and platelets. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can see here, there's no B-cell degradation in platelets with this drug, uh, but this is like a TLL tumor cell line. It's very nice degradation. Uh, so this is just the schematics of that. And again, uh, uh, as a result, you can kill the tumor cells, but you don't kill platelets. So, so this drug right now is in clinical trial in solid tumors, uh, and it's actually completed uh, um, the uh, phase one portion of it. They did see some drop in platelets, but it was much less than with Navitoclax. I think because the drug still binds to some extent and still inhibits a little bit of b cell cell function but it was reversible and no other toxicity was seen. Uh, we published that it's quite effective in the TLR models. Uh, uh, and uh, recently we also moved towards the dual BCO2XL product, which is not yet in the clinic. Uh, and we published this work in AML. Uh, and we showed that this dual product, we call it 753B, uh, it was actually quite effective in all primary AML samples including those that were resistant to venetoclax. So there's, uh, um, you know, there's degradation of BCL XL as you would expect. We actually didn't see much de de degradation of BCL2 in primary cells, but it would see in the cell lines. Uh, so we think that's a potential for using dual BCL2 XL inhibitors in AML as well. Um, and the other aspect of it that is very kind of popular in the solid tumor literature is uh, the uh, role of BCL XL in senescent cells. Uh, so what we know, the senescent cells, the cells that survive chemotherapy, and uh, but they can kind of revert back and become uh, chemoresistant and uh, metastatic cells in the setting of breast cancer or lung cancer and so forth. It's much less known in senescence and EML, uh, but uh, um, there was a paper by Ari Melnick's group that showed that chemotherapy can actually induce senescent cells. So this is like essay you use for the C12 FDG, uh, where you can show that within the viable cells, a fraction of them are actually senescent. And the senescent cells, they depend on BCL XL for survival. So when we sorted out the senescent cells, we showed that BCL XL was upregulated, which was, which was consistent with the literature. And then when we looked at the markers of senescence, this is cell line. So chemo is inducing all the senescence phenotypes. But when we use this uh, BCL XL degrader, we can reverse that. And uh, showed here as well. So we think that there is a potential efficacy of BCL XL inhibition in this uh, dormant senescent cells, because we, it's really hard to like identify them in patients. Like uh, you know, the the assays are not very well established. Uh, uh, but I think there's a lot of interest using BCL XL inhibitors as senolytic in a variety of different sort of conditions, including solid tumors, leukemias, and so forth. And finally, like I told you that there are some AML subsets that are B cell XL dependent, and this is one of them. So this is like totally horrible entity called acute erythroid leukemia. I know Dr. Shu here has done a lot of work on that, uh, but it's, uh, in the old classification is AML M6, um, and it has all of these erythroid markers, and it has very high rates of p mutation, right? So I already told you that vinyl class does not work for p mutant AML, and sure enough, in all clinical trials, patients who were AEL patients who were treated with vinyl class, they progress very quickly. So that's not a, a solution, but uh, um, there was a, we collaborated with the work with a group at the University of Helsinki, and they, they published this very nice paper last year in Blood, so they looked at uh, uh, dependency in AEL using the CRISPR screens or drug screens. And one of the top one was actually BCLXL. This is a gene called BCL2L1 that uh, controls BCLXL. 
Um, and you can see that it also was true for the uh, drug screen as well. Uh, they showed this and they confirmed that in the cell lines. Uh, um, and if you use a different uh, like gene expression data set, so again, this is all M6, also M7, which is megakaryocytic leukemia. They have high expression here, very high expression. And this is a St. Jude cohort as well. So they have a high expression of BCL cell on a transcriptional level. So we think it's because the erythroid cells have, you know, naturally utilizing this protein for survival and this is preserved. Uh, they also showed some efficacy in the in vivo models. So we are interested in using the PROTAC uh, for this indication. And uh, we think mechanistically it makes a lot of sense because again, in erythroid cells, the main transcription factor that drives uh, kind of development is GATA1. And we show that there is a very direct correlation between BCL2L1 and GATA1. Um, this is uh, activity from the gene expression analysis in both different data sets. This was collaboration with St. Jude team, but there's no correlation with BCO2. So really in AEL, um, I think there's transcriptional upregulation and dependency on BCLXL. Uh, based on some of the prior work published, we know that this GATA1 directly binds the BCO2L1 uh, locus and uh, we have now also data in AL in collaboration with, again, uh, Ilaria from St. Jude. Um, and uh, using this uh, degrader, so this is original BCLXL degrader. This is like a next generation. We show that the cell lines that are completely resistant to venetoclax here in green, uh, they can be nicely killed by this BCLXL degrader. Uh, we also tested this in few primary samples that you know failed all kinds of uh, regimens, including migrolimab. And we show the B-select cell degradation here and very nice response. Um, so again, this is preclinical work. Uh, we, we are trying to get the drug. If we get funding for the trials, it's still ongoing. Uh, but uh, uh, we feel that this is uh, hopeful. And uh, in fact, I learned that uh, Abvi just approved the Navitoclax for uh, the subset of uh, AEL. Uh, between uh, MSK and the MD Anderson Cancer Center. So there will be a small pilot trial, at, at least testing the proof of principle that b cell XL is a driver in this uh, horrible disease. We also see very similar phenotypes in MPN, but I didn't have time to show this data as well. So I'll end here and I uh, would like to postulate that AML is generally BCL2 dependent disease, but then there are some subsets that are dependent on b cell XL or MCL1. And uh, of course, uh, we love the drug because it kind of lowers the threshold. So you can see the synergy with pretty much anything you use. And then you can kind of go back to the lab and figure out why. <laughs> but but uh, this was really like, you know, born in the clinical trials where I showed you synergy with chemotherapy, with the hypermethylene agents, with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And, uh, you know, the, the field has really like exploded using this drug as a sensitizer. Uh, some of the, you know, trials that I mentioned are ongoing and immune therapies I mentioned to you before. Um, now, resistance is obviously is a major issue, um, and it's largely driven, we think, by PFC loss or signaling mutations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I showed you what we're trying to do about that. Um, but then there are subsets that are B-cell XL dependent, and we are quite excited about using this uh, B-cell XL inhibitors or products um, in this setting. So I'll end here. So I have many, many co-workers, collaborators uh, from both my MD Anderson uh, lab that has now only partially moved to Einstein. So I have a new lab at Einstein and my clinical collaborators at MD Anderson, especially Courtney who led AML VLA -A trial, Naval who has done a lot of triplet combinations and many other investigators, of course, Dr. Kantajna who has been really like pushing up to go forward with this HMA event trial despite the fact that single agent was not as efficacious. And uh, a lot of collaborators from uh, Montefiore and Einstein were developing this new programs that I showed to you. Um, and many uh, collaborations with the companies, but also academic collaborators. So I would like to acknowledge Tony Litai, who has been really like, you know, developed this first approach with me um, in the lab. And, uh, uh, you know, we think that because of that work, Venelgas really went into AML. And we have collaboration with Andrew Wei at uh, Melbourne and with the uh, St. Jude team and Dao Hong Zhou for the product. So I'll end here. Sorry, it's like five minutes before the end of the hour, but I am happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you.
any account start now. You have questions in Zoom? Um, a fantastic talk. Very few people actually bridge the the clinic and the lab like you do, clinical trials and lab, which is amazing. Um, so I know this is not primarily your research, but why would you think the metronomic use uh, of HMA with venetoclax would actually work for TP50, uh, TP53 while the regular dosing would not? I think the regular dosing induces DNA damage and essentially leads to the selection of P53 lost cells. So you kind of lose your hypermethylene advantage, whatever that is. Again, I don't know how the hypermethylene agents work in uh, P53 mutated AML at all. But I think what happens with the regular dosing, uh, there's DNA damage, which was shown by Steve Gore and others before. Uh, and the cells, they're just like being selected for. So all you get is selection of cells that are like PFC mutated, they're resistant to DNA damaging drugs. And so there's very limited like advantage. While with metronomic dosing, you really like rely on hypermethylating effects of the drug and then, you know, you, you get benefit. But again, you know, it's a hand-waving argument. Uh, but uh, we are encouraged to see that in the prospective trial with the, uh, you know, about 10 patients treated that the data stand. So this, you know, again, they're going to remission about like 50, 60%. And as of right now, survival is about 11 months. But again, like short follow-up, you know, it's a, a small number of patients. So I'm like, you know, I've been hesitant presenting this data till I actually, you know, saw the survival data. But we're hoping that, you know, this will stand. But again, it's not curative. So we definitely need something else to add to that. about um, what's being done towards um, tissue-specific MCL1 inhibitors. So in, or in order to avoid the cardiotoxicity, you talk beautifully about bcl cell, for example. Um, unfortunately, nothing that I'm aware of. Um, I heard that there's some approaching making approaches making the ADC. Um, I haven't had yet chance to get any of those to my lab. So people are thinking about that. I think it's probably ongoing, but I'm not aware yet that there's any like, you know, compound that is close to clinic. But I think that would be the way to go. Now the VHL is expressed in the heart. So, you know, there's also uh, effort by Stephen Fezzik, who is now at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, to look at all 600 ubiquitin ligase and try to understand the tissue specificity. Obviously, for MCL1, we have to avoid the heart. And I think that effort is still ongoing as far as the products. But I think perhaps using the antibody drug conjugate um, maybe is the way to go. Um, you know, there was the B7H3 BCLXL conjugate that went into solid tumor trials. It somehow didn't make it, but kind of similar approach perhaps can be used in AMO, but nothing close to clinic yet. Thank you. Thank you. Looking at the evolution and the clinical slides that you showed in the trial, right? With single agent venetoclax, we all agree, is very modest activity in AMO. In that phase three study that you showed with Gertin, in the first three months, AZO and CUBs don't separate. After that, the curves start to separate. But everybody reaches CR after one cycle. I think. What are we doing there? I think the probably the people don't die with ASA after the first month either. So they still, you know, the survival with ASA sightings is about nine months, right? So they, even though they don't get into remission, they are still, you know, alive and they continue on study. And so they curve separate later. That's my guess. But uh, you're right. You know, remissions happen after one to two months with the venetoclax, uh, and uh, there are no remission with azacitidine. But it's because I guess they're still kind of able to maintain people alive with all our supportive key and everything. They they are still there. That's my understanding. Go back into that paper that you're a part of the Curtis paper that. The older NPM on positive. I have a feeling when Nick presents the data of triplet combination, they are highly choosing NPM on positive patients that is chemo sensitive or myelosuppression sensitive, and then they're tagging it up with the FIG3 data. Because they're seeing a flat curve, like that, that Curtis paper you have, the first three months it's a flat curve, drop, drop, drop. 
and we know what addition of three class of free three inhibitor has done till now. When number five being is AML being oligoclonal, uh -huh. how much emphasis can we give just to the BCL component and looking into resistance? Because the myelosuppression component takes care of it for three to six months. Very good. We don't have anything to that extent compared to cytotoxic therapy in the past. Garcia presented recently in the post transplant period, and mm -hmm. they're the one that's maintenance. Even there, the curves first three to six months and then drop, drop, drop. You don't have a leukemia there at that stage. It's not the number of aquatic stem cells. What do you think the resistance is in that context when you're using ASO1 in the post transplant context? Oh, I, I don't think I'm able to answer that question. So um, I'm not sure what, uh, you know, I don't think that this is just mouse suppression causing people to die, but uh, there's really like relapses going on, right? And uh, I assume that this is still escape of some of the clones that are not being eliminated, but I don't know the data that well. But uh, yeah, the point is well taken that, you know, the triplet the data, <clears throat> Uh, as far as like, you know, there's a lot of discussion. If you have MP1 flex 3 commutated clone, can it be eliminated with venetoclax alone or not? Um, the data are not very clear, but uh, at least from the early eight data, we know that flex 3 mutated patients, even if they had MP1, this is not published, but I looked at that in the RAS context. Uh, the survival is still shorter than for those who have only MP1. So there's still that contribution of the flex 3 clone to the like relapse, earlier relapse, uh, despite the fact that you target the, you know, presumably stem cell MP1 clone with venetoclax. Uh, but I don't know really how like clonal dynamics happen there. Uh, but I do think that triplet adds in that sense that it will target the flex 3 clone uh, within even MP1. But again, you know, I don't have data to that. So maybe one last question. Uh, given your extensive work with drug development in AML and you alluded to the Twitter wars on some of these uh, data, I think one big question that keeps coming up is if, uh, if an agent has no single agent activity, does it, can it have realistically a chance of being synergistic in a combination? Some people pointed to venetoclax as the rule that this, but actually venetoclax, as you said, does have single agent activity. It's not much, but it does have activity. And some people took a victory lab with magrolimab because it has zero single agent activity and all the fuss about the combinations and then the phase three. So, so is your sense that uh, if you have no single agent activity, can you really be synergistic in combination as a general yeah, I think it was like a general question. Uh, I would probably be very worried about going to phase three with a drug that has no single agent activity. <laughs> As you said, venoclax did have activity, you know, it reduced blast in 50% of patients. Uh, and uh, there are data also in the frontline setting where uh, they did the bone marrow, they did seven days venoclax pretreatment, just single agent, and they did the bone marrow. That was done in Australia. And they also show reduction or even like remission in about 50% of patients. So it does have single agent activity, but it also like different mechanistically because it's like a sensitizer, right? So you can, you know, think that even if you didn't have that single agent activity in combination, you might have had. But uh, I personally, like, I'm very worried that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I would develop the drug that has absolutely no single agent activity in combinations, you know, going forward. Uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.